proceed. I'm going to have some more questions, Madam Chair, but I'll cease for now. That's fine. Uh, 825, Drought Water System Consolidation. So Trailer Bill 825 uh, concerns a problem that's been confronting a number of small communities as they deal with the consequences of the drought, but it's also a problem that the, both the Department of Public Health as well as the State Water Bo Resources Control Board has seen prior to the drinking water program moving to the Water Board. During this drought, we have seen some communities running out of water completely, and yet nearby water systems may or may not be willing to serve customers of the failing system. This proposal would authorize the State Water Resources Control Board after consultation with uh, local agency formation commissions and a public hearing and under certain limited circumstances to, as part of its drinking water permitting processes, uh, require consolidation of these failing systems into nearby public water systems. All right, let's move on to 827, uh, no, 826, sorry. Trailer Bill 826. Uh, Excellent idea. <laughs> I figured I might get a little more friendly uh, reception here than I did in the assembly. Uh, trailer Bill 826 would encourage responsible water consumption. Silence consent. doesn't mean unfriendly. It just means silence for the moment. Would encourage responsible water consumption and conservation by providing uh, residents with accurate information about the volume and cost of, water, of their water use through a process known as submetering. It would require the measurement of water consumption by individual dwelling units in newly constructed multi-unit residences through submetering. Essentially, the uh, definition of newly constructed under the trailer bill language is a multi-family residence, not including uh, hospitals, dorms, residential facilities, um, that is pulling a water service connection after January 1, 2017. It provides a framework for charging of water used by tenants by property owners and third party builders. And it requires an update to the plumbing code in the next triennial cycle of, or the next update cycle for the building code after January 1, 2016, to ensure that it provides notice to developers and local governments and promotes state uniformity in submetering. New construction. New construction, correct. Supported by the BIA. I just throw that in. Madam Chair. Yes. I don't know if uh, CSAC is going to get involved in this um, or the League of Cities. They're derelict in their responsibilities if they don't. Uh, this is another sweeping usurpation of local authority, in my opinion, yeah. imposing the state on, on, on the locals and great impact to the citizens and the businesses of those local communities, including your requiring of uh, the plumbing and building code updates, uh, the framework of charging water. Uh, this is just a sweeping state takeover. Can you convince me otherwise? How, how, how are you empowering local government to be responsive to their citizens without dictating, being dictated from by the state? Well, first of all, it does recognize in the trailer language as posted up does allow local agencies that have already been adopted requirements or that have more restrictive requirements, including upgrade cycles for their multifamily residences to continue to enforce those. However, the trailer bill language does provide a uniform submetering consistency at, for newly constructed homes after or multifamily residences after January 1, 2017. And simply, uh, Senator Nielsen, this is to address the issue of people simply can't manage what they don't measure. If people don't know what their water use is and have no capability for determining what their water use is, it's hard to effectively send a conservation signal and a message to those individual users. And one of the things that we have seen in drought response amongst the local agencies who are you know, struggling mightily to promote conservation is that ensuring accurate use reporting to their customers is helpful. And one of the other things that's helpful is providing a comparison to how they do, people like to know how they're doing compared to their neighbors. And this particular trailer bill, for example, provides uh, an opportunity for individual residences, residential users in a multifamily residence to know what their water use is and provides a benchmark for comparison to what typical family of four residential water use is indoors. And so we believe it's consistent with all the goals that the governor has stated and consistent with promoting conservation by all of our citizens. 
Are there not a lot of cities that have metering right now and reporting to the citizens of their water use and comparing with baselines and such? Don't many cities already do that now? Many cities do that, and some cities and localities have required sub-metering for multifamily residences, but the reality is most multifamily residences in California do not have individual meters, and so the individuals don't know their water use and, and really can't account for themselves compared to neighbors and com compared to what we're seeing in a, in a statewide conservation ethic. Would the state or the local authority then have the ability to levy such fines as 500 to $10,000 on these individual, say, homeowners? Um, no, this is outside of the local conservation structure, and I know we have representatives from uh, Building Standards Commission and HCD here, but it would, it would be a provision of the California Building Code. And so going forward after January 1, 2017 for new construction, it would essentially just be a requirement on, home, on multifamily residences. So you could not construct, that's the point. But uh, how about the, right? You, well, you could construct, you it would just have it, to be you submetered, submit. yes. But what about a homeowner? Let's get back to the metering who uh, it's determined that uh, this family is using water in excess of the governor's 30% mandate or 26% or 25, 35%. So therefore, you're going to get fined because you use too much water? At this point in time, there's no conservation structure that does that. Um, the trailer bill language provides a mechanism for how the property owner um, would pass through the bill. Cause it will, will most likely happen in most instances because these are submeters. These are not meters to the local water agency. It is still the property owner that will receive a bill and then there's a formula to pass that bill essentially through or there are alternative formulas to pass the bill through to the individuals. Um, there isn't any ordinance um, that would be enforceable directly against the individuals at this point in time. And if a local agency were to come up with something, yeah, that'd be highly speculative at this point in time. I may have some more. Thank you for that answer. Jim, this is only new construction. Uh, many apartments, in fact, uh, many, apartment, many apartments have already done this. Uh, this is only new construction. And there's been uh, city of San Diego has already uh, imposed this law works well and uh, there have been there's a tremendous amount of support and bipartisan support for the uh, effort uh, so far including the BIA and others and I think uh, if CSAC's around they might want to speak to this or the league I don't think they're opposed anyway let's move on may, um, may I ask one yes just one comment on metering speak. are we going to have a chance for the public to speak Pardon? We're going to have a chance for the yes, public? Yes, on all of them when we're finished. Okay. I, I sure. know it's about submetering, which is mm -hmm. uh, fine, and it's moving forward, so thank you for that clarification on new units mm -hmm. um, so they can put in the correct yeah. pipes and mm -hmm. meters and everything. But uh, what what is what are we doing about expediting those people who still aren't on water meters? Or I read an alarming story the other week about someone using 218 uh, as a vehicle to just do a flat rate forever, even though they use a huge amounts of water. We have several areas of the state who coincidentally are mostly in areas where you have severely overdrafted groundwater basins, still not metered. If you're from what, Southern California, it drives you crazy as other parts of the state are on their five tiers and their Huge fines. So I'll, I'll just briefly touch on this one. Uh, it's a little bit outside of what the water board's involved in, but as you know, the, the legislature did accelerate the requirement for meter installation, uh, I believe it was back in the 2009 uh, era. It's still 2025 or something out there. Yeah, although- A lot of people have them. They're installed, they're just not hooked up. Yeah. And so, what, what is happening is the local agencies are sort of struggling both with the logistical issues associated with installation and then, you know, how do you go about fairly billing amongst your customers until you have them all on meters. Um, the issue of Prop 218 for those cities um, that have gone ahead and installed meters and then have to put in place a rate structure is very challenging. Many cities have had good success in terms of developing rate structures and surviving a protest process and getting their rate structures in pay place. 
But if uh, the ratepayers are able to get enough uh, votes, uh, it can create a real challenge for the local agency. And there is nothing in the trailer bill language, um, and the administration has not identified at this point in time a fix for that. But there was some talk when um, Ms. Marcus was here about the State Water Board doing a model ordinance that would assist those areas in putting together a rate structure that would survive the uh, well, I, scrutiny of the courts? What Chair Marcus was describing is um, the board is working with, with the Association of California Water Agencies and with the League of Cities and CSAC to assist agencies on Prop 218 compliance. But in the end, if you go through a protest process and the rate payers do not approve the rate structure, uh, it may be difficult. I mean, we can provide tools and we will be providing tools. In fact, a, le a website went live That's earlier this happening. week. The majority of the people like you do a benefit assessment district are voting against it so they stay on a flat rate. Right, and that's the challenge. And no matter how much water they use. Mm -hmm. And there must be a way though, so you, you can obtain perhaps Prop 1 or state dollars for something if your area is not metered or something, but uh, uh, it, that is simply not right and unfair. That, there has to be a way, a carrot or a stick or some, some message here that you can't have it both ways. You can't have money for your groundwater basin to replenish it if you don't have uh, any ability to manage your water supply. Anyway, it's commentary, thank you. Just a question before you get to the CEQA, uh, the three on CEQA exemptions, <coughs> trailer bills, um, the water audit issue, which is something I'm really interested in. I had a bill, I have a bill on it. Um, did you look at that in terms of a potential um, trailer bill? Um, I really couldn't speak on all the different things. There was a robust discussion within the administration on different options. Yeah. That's all I was saying. All right. It's one that enjoys a lot of support and would result in tremendous savings of water. Yeah, the, on the leaks, you're on Yeah, the bill. leaks, it's, yeah. It's very um, popular down in Southern California. Yeah. Bill. All right, moving on to the CEQA exemptions. Uh, there are three proposed, I believe. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, the drought stormwater plans first. Oh, apologies. I apologize. It will that it probably makes sense to skip over the first of the CEQA exemptions and then cluster them. So I'll deal with trailer bill 830, which uh, mm -hmm. concerns the drought resource um, or drought stormwater plans and the stormwater resource plans that uh, Executive Director Howard uh, mentioned earlier. And this is related to Senator Pavley's bill 985 from last year. Uh, Proposition one provides grants for stormwater and dry weather runoff capture projects, but they are only available to projects that have a stormwater resource plan that is in compliance with part 2.3 of Division 6 of the Water Code. Part 2.3 was amended last year by Senate Bill 985 to require the State Water Board by July 1, 2016 to adopt guidelines so that local agencies could adopt compliant stormwater resource plans. Unlike the funding guidelines in Proposition 1, the guidelines required by Part 2.3 were provided a stream were not provided a streamlined approval process to accelerate award and disbursement of Proposition 1 funds. This proposal would make the State Water Board's guidelines for stormwater resource plans subject to the same expedited process and rulemaking exemptions as Prop 1 guidelines. Absent the proposal, the $100 million for stormwater projects that was in the Governor's May Revise and you voted on a few moments ago would be delayed until after the State Water Board adopted those guidelines through an Administrative Procedures Act rulemaking process. That would not occur until the existing statutory deadline or shortly before the existing statutory deadline of July 1, 2016. All right, let's move on. Uh, eight, well, I'll move back. 827 and 831. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair. I am Chris Calfee, Senior Welcome. Counsel at the Office of Planning and Research. Uh, trailer Bill 827 addresses local ordinances for the protection of groundwater resources. Under current law, counties uh, are responsible for permitting well drilling. Uh, a number of counties have recently adopted ordinances to further protect groundwater resources from groundwater mining and export, among other things. Uh, this proposal would do two things. Uh, first, it would include legislative findings indicating that 
that regulation of groundwater is uh, a police power, uh, is a local government police power to protect uh, public safety and welfare. Uh, the second thing it would do would provide a limited term CEQA exemption for the adoption of local groundwater protection ordinances. Uh, that that uh, exemption would remain in effect until July 1, 2017, or as long as the governor's state of emergency is in effect. All right. Yes, Senator Nielsen. Madam Chair, I want the record to reflect that at least this member considers this police power sweeping. And I'm going to use a strong word qualifying that I, I hope it ever comes to this level, but it's almost Gestapo, the state imposing on locals and on individual citizens of this state. Now, I notice in this particular one, the exemption expires in two years with the cessation of the drought emergency, whichever's later. So I'm glad to see something ends at the end of the drought emergency. But keep in mind, under the legislation last year, the governor could effectively have a rolling drought emergency, just continuing or leave it into effect indefinitely. And here's an irony, again, that needs to be pointed out. Exemption is needed to protect counties that wish to adopt groundwater protection from CEQA lawsuits because it could delay the implementation of such an ordinance. Another example of government exempting itself from what it opposes on the citizens and the businesses of California. That just further undermines the trust that people have in government. And I want to say here, with a compliment to Chair Marcus, who has been very accessible and, and seems to be trying very valiantly uh, to, to be respectful of water rights in face of this emergency. I want to give that credit where I think it is due. On the other hand, I have to say that everything that I have said about uh, these water rights uh, have proven to be absolutely correct. Uh, the board in one of its uh, first regulations said that they're going to protect uh, senior in pre-1914, but we have the right to. There were a lot of denials of citizens, of people of special interest that should have known better and argued better as this was all being proposed that they were going to be comfortable that those rights would be protected. And now we know that they are not protected. And even pre-1914 and... Uh, and uh, some have even said these water rights are antiquated. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if things like the Constitution and historic water rights uh, are antiquated and will change them based on contemporary circumstance, even this case be a drought, what trust can people ever have in their government again? This is an issue far bigger than just the drought. It is an issue of trust in our government. All right. Did you want to speak? No. Uh, I, just a, a question out of curiosity. I, I act, well, not a surprise to Senator Nielsen. Um, this is relevant to some counties down in my area, and especially along the central coast. They're in a crisis. Their groundwater table has gone down precipitously. They're trying to comply with the Groundwater Management Act. They're faced with saltwater intrusion. They're not dependent on the state water project. They're on their own down there. And several county supervisors, boards of supervisors have put sort of a moratorium, if you will, on new permits for new wells. Um, it's interesting, the people that usually oppose <laughs> CEQA are now clamoring for CEQA in order to perhaps delay the inevitable in a process. I assume, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume uh, a negative declaration would probably be rendered because under the California Environmental Quality Act, you're trying to save water or keep it from being contaminated or you're putting protections in place. Isn't that a rather quick process? You have notice and then a negative deck. Uh, but this is in only if you define an emergency situation, this goes this police power is possible by the supervisor. I think they need this tool, so I'm not arguing the merits. And to clarify, this would provide an, provide an exemption from CEQA's requirements for those specified local ordinances. But if you didn't have the exemption, 
correct. Wouldn't a negative declaration, which is a relatively expedited process if you don't have to do an EIR, be warranted in most cases? A study would need to be done that would either lead to a negative declaration or if there were a potential for significant effects than an environmental impact. Because you would think it would be a benefit to the environment overall to put a moratorium or a pause on drilling additional wells if you're wiping out your groundwater supply, correct? Correct. So that this one, I, I don't, I'm not big on CEQA exemptions, but this one I think you could implement without a CEQA exemption by relying on a negative declaration or some kind of streamlined process. I'm open <coughs> to streamlined processes. Uh, I, I try not to create new precedents for CEQA exemptions. I also think it's important that uh, reading the language here, um, it's going to include legislative findings clarifying that local governments do regulate, uh, may regulate groundwater pursuant to their police power. And I remember in the last drought, when you're dealing with transfers and a number of things, it's really important to clarify that so that you, you recognize that the locals do have the power uh, to come up with a groundwater protection ordinance and ought to be about it, frankly, in the middle of a drought, uh, particularly if they're in a basin that is um, uh, of serious concern. And many of them are. So I think there are, there are um, op opportunities here for local governments to step up and uh, protect their local groundwater. And if they don't, then the state needs to do it for them. And that's what the legislation said. So an opportunity um, and uh, at least for two years. All right, um, let's move on to the CEQA exemption for drought mitigation. Yes, Trailer Bill 831 addresses uh, a CEQA exemption for certain uh, drought-related uh, projects. Uh, under existing law, the Public Resources Code exempts uh, projects that are responding to a disaster that ha for which a state of emergency has been declared. There's another exemption in the Public Resources Code for projects that prevent or mitigate emergencies. Uh, but the, the term emergency is defined in the in the code in such a way that some courts have found that drought does not qualify as an emergency. So this, uh, this provision would uh, do a couple of things. First, it would say that certain categories of projects uh, could be exempt from CEQA provided that, this, that the governor has declared a state of emergency. And those categories of projects include uh, connecting existing homes to public, uh, to community water systems, uh, providing interconnections between community water systems, uh, another category is the construction or expansion of stormwater infiltration facilities or recycled water treatment facilities. Uh, another is uh, the construction or expansion of recycled water distribution infrastructure, uh, provided that it's within uh, rights of way. And finally, uh, a catch-all category for any uh, specific activities that the governor might identify in a state of emergency proclamation. I have a problem with the language here. Um, it's it is expansive. Um, we come at this from a different direction. Uh, I'm not interested in seeing, it's not clear to me what kinds of projects uh, if, declared, if declared in this emergency uh, could then move forward without CEQA review. Um, and I am particularly concerned about the tunnels, obviously, uh, but actually any major infrastructure project that might be deemed an emergency um, for the duration of the, for the, in this context. Uh, I think it needs to be, um, the language really is making me uncomfortable and I think we're gonna really need to pare down. The governor in, in his discussions um, with them through the media said, well, it would just be, it wouldn't be the big projects. I can't remember the exact terminology. It was sort of very general. Um, but I see nothing here that would um, differentiate among projects. Um, and I'm concerned about that, very concerned. And I suspect most of the legislators who represent the Delta would also be concerned. And there may be other projects too, um, not certain. The, w one response is that uh, this, this particular language, it, it does include a number of limitations. Uh, the first limitation is that any of the projects that would be approved would have to be approved during a declared state of emergency. 
uh, in addition to that, it does identify specific categories of projects uh, for which the exemption would apply. And this is in contrast to the existing exemption for prevention or mitigation of emergencies. It, it's not further qualified than that. Uh, so, so at least and this recourse? provides certain categories. And recourse? If you disagree with that, if you disagree, if, if, if suddenly it becomes a uh, mechanism to uh, exempt a project that really ought like not a, be exempted. Like a desalination plant. Yeah, for example. Just Thank you. getting you out of That's, the tunnels. Let me get out of the tunnels. We'll get to that in a minute. But let's talk about, yeah, desalination plant. We're talking major, major infrastructure. This Controversial in nature. In nature. I, I appreciate the, the controversy around that. Uh, again, the, the language as written, it, it is limited to certain types of infrastructure pro projects, specifically uh, uh, stormwater infiltration facilities and recycled water facilities. Um, it, it doesn't include the expansive list of uh, potential drought mitigation. Well, I... If it's that limited, I need to see the language on this. Really, I'm very concerned about this. It's, it seems expansive, but maybe it isn't in terms of the language, and maybe needs to be um, refined quite a bit more. And what did telecommunications have to do with the drought? It says emergency. Excuse me. Through the chair. Uh, mm -hmm. Emergency telecommunications. Uh, that reference is in the background section describing previously approved exemptions uh, by the legislature. So this, that was in reference to the LA RICS. Oh, that was very popular. Hmm. We're still down, down in Southern California. Um, the Board of Supervisors were left with, it, it's, they canceled about half of those because there was no secret review and the public just went crazy in where they were locating these towers. Even the LA County Fire Department were opposing them. It was interesting. It still is interesting. So that's not a good example. <laughs> All right, further, anything else that the uh, administration is proposing? The, the, final, uh, the final trailer bill relates to a, a limited CEQA exemption for uh, the activities of the uh, Building Standards Commission uh, in prior session, uh, Assembly Bill 2282 set in motion a process uh, to update the building codes to provide for dual plumbing. Uh, this CEQA exemption would apply to the adoption of those codes. All right. Okay, uh, further, further comments from um, the committee? Thank you very much. We look forward to the uh, specific language in the trailer bills. All right.